direction, but again, just <coughs> excuse me to um, help us, you know, again from 17, where you know God's already telling Abraham that hey, you know, you are going to be the father of many nations, and yes, it's going to be from you. And so now we come up on chapter 18. And so the Lord, Yahweh, appeared to him before the oaks of Mamre, and where he was sitting next to the tent door in the heat of the day. When he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing opposite him. Okay, so who are these three men? Three men, and we'll, find, and we'll see this later on. Two of them were angels, but one was God. Okay, so it was God in, in a human form. Because this human form is going to eat and everything else. But um, and you'll and you'll see this down you know as we continue reading and the three and the three um, and he when he saw them he ran from the tent door to meet them bowed himself down to the earth and he said my lord and now the word for lord here is Adonai okay or Adonai and and, and that word means lord and master but that that word's also going to be used um, by Lot when he when he addresses the two angels. Okay, so it's not a, a, an actual name, you know, of God, but it's it's Adonai is used in conjunction with other characteristics in, in the Old Testament. So he, he, you know, he says, "If I found favor in your sight, please do not pass your servant by. Please let a little, little water be brought out to wash your feet, rest yourselves underneath the tree, and I will go get some a piece of bread." that you may refresh yourselves, after you may go on, since you have visited your servant. And they said to him, So do as you have said. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah, and said, Quick, pare three measures of fine flour, kneel it, and make some bread cakes. Then Abraham ran to the herd. He took a tender young choice calf and gave it to a servant, and he hurried to prepare it. He took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared, and placed it before them, and they were, and he was standing by them underneath the tree as they ate. So you know, real quick, he's just being a gracious host in what he was doing. And so you know, then they said to him, and I love this. He says, "Where is Sarah, your wife?" And he says, "They're in a tent." And he said, "This is God now. I will surely return to you this time next year, and behold, Sarah, your wife, will have a son." And Sarah was listening at the tent door, which was behind them. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and advanced in their years, and Sarah was past childbearing. Now we've already discussed this last week when we were looking at chapter 17. And, I, and when God first mentioned this to Abraham, when he was changing the names, you know, Abraham's laughed and kept, did, did a good job helping us explain, you know, understand the, the differences of, of laugh in Hebrew. There was a masculine form and a feminine form and stuff like this. But this, you know, Sarah's laughing here. And again, Isaac's name is laughter. So both their parents, you know, bottom line, both their parents are laughing or are, are really kind of um, amused because, you know, up, up to this point in time, you know, I mean, they, they, they face in a sense, or they've dealt with, let's put it not face, but they've dealt with the, the somewhat of a disgrace, saying that God's not really going to provide Sarah with a child. You know, and so up to this point in time, they've dealt with it. they found other ways to, to mitigate that issue by allowing um, Adam to have, um, to, to, to marry Hagar and to have a child, Ishmael. And so up until this point in time, you know, they kind of bypassed, but they, you know, in their minds, their promise was, hey, Abraham's going to be the father of many nations. They didn't, you know, they didn't really expect that now to happen through Sarah. And so, um, so he says, surely next time I behold your, Sarah, your wife, or I have a son. And Abraham and Sarah were both advanced in the years. Sarah was, wet, was past childbearing. She laughed to herself, saying, after I have become old, shall I have the pleasure my Lord being so old, uh, my, my, my Lord being old is so old also. And, and the Lord said to Abram, why does Sarah laugh? Say, I shall indeed bear the child when I am old, so old. Is anything too difficult for the Lord? At the important time, I will return to you. And at this time next year, Sarah will have a son. Now let's just stop real quick. I love this one little line. We won't, and I won't die again, but I just love this one little line. He says, is there anything impossible with God? 
Now, you know, it's kind of mentioned, you know, it was about Moses and his mom maybe being about 130 years. But there's actually several passages in Scripture where, you know, God had initiated a birth through couples who were old or through doing a miraculous birth with, with burden. So who's, who's one other one that we recognize that where God did something really, really miraculous on birth? Mary. Mary? Who is the other one? Um, oh, uh, Zachariah, uh, John's parents. Yes. Okay. So, you, I mean, you know, Elizabeth. That's what I was trying to think of. Yeah. Elizabeth was also well in her age. Mm -hmm. And and Zechariah is like going in there and, and, and so Zechariah goes and, and the angel comes before him and says, Hey, you know, Elizabeth's gonna have a child. Whoa, he laughed. Mm -hmm. You know, he shouldn't laugh, but he laughed. And next thing you know, the angel says, I'm the one that stands before God. Why are you doubting me? And all of a sudden, bam, you can't talk no more. You know? And so, but then uh, Mary, she hears about this and she's going, Wow. You know, and then also um, with Peter, with Peter and the disciples, with they're with Jesus, and you know, and they're saying, "Can anybody be saving God?" And Jesus says, "Nothing's impossible with God, as far as from saving." Now there was a lot of other births that have happened. Um, there's Samson, and his mom's not named in Scripture, but he was kind of like a miraculous birth. And then there was people like you know, as we read, read on, there was Isaac who prayed for Rebecca. There was Jacob who prayed for um, for Rachel. Um, there was um, Hannah, who you know who was um, childbearing for a long time, and finally ended up having Samuel. And what she did. So I mean, it's kind of neat to see how God can just continues to work through this. But anyway, so he makes a real clear point. He says, "Is there anything too difficult for the Lord?" So Sarah denies it, however, saying, "I did not laugh." For she was afraid. But God said to her, No, you did laugh. Period. Okay? Then the men rose up from there and looked down toward Sodom, and Abraham was walking with them to send them off on their way. The Lord, Yahweh, as it is written in Hebrew, um, shall hide from Abraham what I'm about to do. He's talking to the other two angels. But he's letting Abraham hear this. And there's a purpose. You'll see this in a minute. He's letting Abraham hear this. Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do, since Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation, and in him and all the nations of the earth will be blessed. For I have chosen him so that he may and listen, this, so that he may continue to command his children and his household after him to keep the ways of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring upon Adam, I mean Adam, Abraham. What he has spoken to him, okay? So, and I love this piece because this, this kind of now flows into what we're going to see about Lot. But he says, for I have chosen him to do what? What did he say? Oh, take care of his kids and command his children and his household after him to keep the, and keep the way of the Lord and do righteous and justice. And I know, and I know Cliff has, has mentioned this and I know Jordan. This, I mean, I think somehow we just have to keep beating ourselves into this. This is a command. Of what we're supposed to be doing as husbands is what we're supposed to be doing as men, and sometimes we just we fail so often as as, as a nation in America. We fail so often by not just doing exactly by commanding his children by his household and keeping the ways of the Lord. And it's like that's our job, and you're going to see this with Lot and the men here. And then he said, and then the Lord said, the outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great. For their sin is exceedingly grave. Okay? So we've already seen up in chapter 13 of Genesis that when Psalm was first mentioned and, and, and stuff like that, that God has already said, hey, the sins of this town is exceedingly great. So I mean we're not just talking about, you know, a lot of times we want to we want to look at um Sodom as just, well, the reason why they got burnt to the ground is because of homosexuality. Uh-uh. It's not just homosexuality. There was a lot going on. We don't know all. We'll see, we, the biggest one we see is the, the um, discretions of wanting to have some relationships with men. But the, the sin that God points out is not just one sin. It's their sins are extremely great. And we saw this at the same time when we go back all the way back to when the flood. Because the world had exceedingly got so terrible 
Okay, so now we see this in Sodom and Gomorrah and then how their sins have finally reached up. Again, we'll go back to, you know, earlier when we, were, when, uh, we was reading and um, God gave Abraham the timetable of where Israel would be and through the slavery and coming out of it and because of the sins of who? The Amorites had not reached their full measure. Okay, but now here we are, we're seeing where God's already seen what's going on in, in Sodom and Gomorrah, and he's getting the place, the measure has been full. He's going to go down. He's going to destroy this town. You know, and so he says, um, so the Lord, the outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great, and their sin is exceedingly great. I will go down now and see if they had done entirely according to its outcry which has come to me, and if not, I will know. So, you know, going, oh, wait a minute, God. What do you mean you don't really know? He's saying this to Abraham. He's talking to Abraham. And he said, and he let Abraham know that he's a just God. And so while he, while he knows exactly what's going to happen, he's, telling, he's saying this in, in, in a path, in, in a way, so Abraham understands that he is a just God. He's not just going to go down and destroy it. Boom. He's going to go down. And, and, and he's telling Abraham, I'm going to go down and I'm going to see if the outcry that I've been hearing about is really true. You know, God, yes, God already knows it's true. But he's allowing Abraham, he's bringing Abraham into, in, into the fellowship to help him understand why he's going down there. In fact, God actually doesn't go down there. It's the two angels that are actually going to go down there. So what, is, see. what is the outcry? What is that? The outcry of sin. Go back to Ephesians where Paul says that we grieve the Holy Spirit. And I think this is I think this is sometimes how we miss all together. Well, I think sometimes we take sin so lightly. You know, we'll, you know, and I'm, I've talked about this before. We'll, we'll take sin and we'll put it in categories. And we'll say, well, this sin here, and you know, telling a little white lie, you know, that's not a big deal. You know, committing murder, definitely a big deal. You know, um, pornography, yeah. It's not a big deal. You know, having adultery, maybe a bigger deal. So we we try, as men and people, we try to categorize sin. But to God, the sin accumulates, and it's an outcry, and it grieves God. And so, in a sense, it's, it's kind of like an outcry, in a sense, just saying, hey, you know, because he, he, that separates God from man, is sin. He can't have a holy and righteous God cannot have a relationship that he in, that he created first to be perfect and then because of sin it separated them. So the outcry is the sin. It's the outcry of just the, cum the cumulativeness of the sin. It's not, like, it's not like just someone's in Sodom and Gomorrah and just praying. No. It's not like mm -hmm. a prayer. No, this, this is just the, the total amount. I mean, it goes, it goes back to, um, to before the flood. The sins of the of the name of the all the people were just out crying in a sense to God. It was just wickedness. It got to the place where, in a sense, how's a better way to put it? It's got to the place where you know, in, in our civil law, well, let's 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 bring it to most recent. What's going on in Portland? You know, and you and you look in the outcry in a sense of the, all the people that are revolting against. And and, 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 and there's and the whole process of what's going on there, there's not even, I mean, it's, it's kind of like what Paul writes in Romans when he says that not only do I continue to do bad, but then I start dragging other people down in, in, in my path because I'm not even recognizing what I'm doing. We watch a lot of the politics. I don't care which side of the politics you want to talk about. We watch a lot of the politics and people get so caught up in their politics. They don't even, it's like, Yes, what you're doing is wrong, but we don't want to recognize it's wrong anymore because we're so caught up in it. And you look what's going on in Portland and the outcry of all that de devastation and everything else. And so you've got the outcry of what's going on. And so you have the government coming in and say, well, we got to figure out some way to put it into this because this is America and we can't continue to do it. And so now we're bringing in federal, we're bringing in troops to stop this. And it's still like, it's not accomplishing what really needs to happen. Not, it, it's definitely not uh, textbook perfect. No, I mean, when you start but the out, but the outcry of all that violence and everything else just violent. reaches out. Right on. 
and says something has to be done. And so from a God's perspective, the outcry of all the sin that's going on in Sodom and Gomorrah is reached to its, to its peak. When the Amorite says, hey, 400 years is going to reach to its peak, here it's reached to its peak. And the outcry of, of the sin that's going on in, in these two cities has reached its peak and says, okay, I'm a righteous God. And this is the thing we have to understand. This is a part of love. This is not a part of vengeance. Okay? And I think that's sometimes we also got to, you know, well, God must have not really liked Sodom and Gomorrah. No, God loves Sodom and Gomorrah. God loved the Amorite. God loved Nineveh. And he said, I mean, so God, you know, God, again, you know, it's not drawn to it, but God's on a mission to redeem a lost world. He created us in his image. And he loves us so much. But yet in that love, he is also a just God. And so the judgments that he passes are not judgments of vengeance. Like for us, you know, well, okay, you really screwed up. I'm going to zap you down. No, uh-uh. You know, God's love and his justice is a perfect justice, but it's a righteous justice. In other words, when he gets to the place where he judges people, it's it. And it's not, it's not a vengeance and not out of hate. You know, I've listened to... Um, it makes me think about all the abortions that happen in this country. Oh, it's got to be a huge... We're going to get to this, yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. without a shadow of a doubt, America... <laughs> Outcry is growing louder yeah. and louder, and we'll get to this in a minute, and louder. There's no doubt about it. So whether it's abortions or adultery, the, um, the numbers of divorces happening in our country, um, the, the pornography, the, you know, just, I mean, the whole, the whole path of just sexual immorality, period. I don't care what, what's, where you want to put your finger at. You know, the wheel, dude. You know it's, it, yeah, it's, you know, it's standing out. And the thing is, is not only is it standing out, but we're even giving credence to it. And we're passing laws to protect it. And, you know, it's kind of like, and this happened, I mean, read history, folks. This happened in Rome. Yeah. Yes, sir. This was happening in Rome when Paul was writing to the churches. Okay, so, you know, you know, homosexuality is not something new. Homosexuality is not just an American thing or anything else. Or a lot of the sexual immoralities that's going on in our country and other countries. It's not new. We're just a repeat of everything that's been going on. Again, it goes, goes back to what Jordan was teaching on Ecclesiastes. Nothing is new under the sun. the sun. And if you understand that, and if you really can see that, nothing is new. Yeah, okay. So, hey, we sent a man up to the moon. Is that not new? Yes, there's exploration. But there's always been exploration. We just stepped it a little bit different. We, we, we had oh, an exploration right. to find this country, to find the land that we, that people thought that the earth was flat and you would fall off a certain place. It's frontier. Yeah. Right. I mean, like you're all seeking. The pioneers, and you're just seeking. Oh, we're really seeking. And so, I mean, again, there's nothing new. I mean, yeah, the technology that we have in here. Yeah, but guess what? It's always been there. Mm -hmm. It's just that we discover, we didn't invent it, we discover it. You know, so all the laws of physics and gravity and everything else, we're discovering these things. You know, we discovered atoms. Not only did we discover it, you know, and Paul knows this well, but we just, not only did we discover atoms, but then we figure out how we can split the cotton picking suckers that we can't even really see to create energy that, you know, supplies the electricity that we have today. So it's, it's just, and, and plus also create a bomb that does something really horrific, you know, and, and we've seen that um, from an atom bomb, which is totally different than the nuclear bombs that we're creating today. But anyway, not to get too sidetracked. But that, I mean, but yeah, that, I mean, we, we, we started a discussion about outcry. And so that's what's going on. It's just that the, that the accumulation of sin that's going on is seemingly great, as, as God said earlier. It's gotten to the place where there's got to be justice. And, you know, and that's the same going to be when, if we ever get a chance to study Revelation, that, you know, how the sins of the world is going to get to a place. There's going to be justice. There it's going to be delivered. No the line will end. Yeah, there will be a line in the sand. There will be a line. Yes. And so, um, and so, um, in verse 22, Then the men got up, turned away from where they were, went towards Simon, but Abraham stayed, uh, was still standing before the Lord. So the two angels left. Okay, so God's now with Abraham. And so, you know, up to this point in time, we had the good news. 
The good news is, hey, you're going to have a kid. It's going to be a miraculous birth. Sarah's going to have a baby in her old age. But hey, we got some bad news also. Sodom and Gomorrah is not doing really hot. And it's not only just not doing it right. Their sins are exceedingly, is exceedingly great. So God's going to, do, you know, he's telling Abraham why he's doing this. But he's telling Abraham for this for a purpose. Because he wants Abraham to be able to teach his children why we should follow the commands of the Lord. Because of what's going on. Now you have to stop and think, who is down at Sodom? Yeah. Now let's, let's, before we get into this, let's watch this moral decay. Okay? When's the first time we hear about Lot and Sodom? What, what happened? It goes back on what? Chapter, chapter before. Huh? The chapter before. Or, no, it's like it's chapter 14 or, th or 12. Yeah. 13. But, um, but, you know. Oh, yeah. What is so there are two, yeah. there are two herds, you know, two families in a sense. The herdsmen were fighting with each other. Abraham goes up before Lot and says, hey, you go to the right, I go to the left. You pick this side, I go to the opposite, you know. And so Lot does what? He looks down and he sees a green field. It's just beautiful. His eyes, yeah, look at this. I'm going to go down. Now here, let me show you a flip side of that. And I don't know if you've ever read the story of um, Ruth. Very short. I think it's four or five chapters. But, you know, Ruth, who's a Moabite, which we'll see where the Moabites come from in a minute. But Ruth, who's a Moabite, she sits there and, she, and, you know, she's a widow. And she's talking to her mother-in-law, who's now a widow, and saying, hey, look, I'm not going to leave you. Lot had the opportunity. He could have said, yeah, yeah. He's seen how God's been blessing Abraham. He could have said, hey, yeah, I know I got to go. We got to separate. But I want to stay close to you because God's really working your life. But what happens is Lot begins to do very much like what um, Eve did when she saw the fruit. Huh. Gold this gold. looks good. So, yeah, you have to begin. This, it doesn't happen overnight. There's a song by um, Casting Crowns or something called Slow Change. And how, you know, and, and this is why it's so important we, we're talking about how we allow sometimes, and, and, and I love this discussion about sin, but we allow sin to become such a, certain sins in our lives that become so normalized that we don't recognize them anymore. In fact, we don't even hear the Holy Spirit grieving inside of us saying it's wrong because we kind of normalized it too, too much in our life. We say, ah, oh, this is not that bad. We get desensitized. You know, but we got desensitized. So Lot, he started off, he let his eyes look and see, hey man, you know, this land looks really good. And staying next to God, to the man that God's really blessing, he goes ahead and chooses on his own, hmm, that looks really good. You know, probably nothing wrong with that. You're not going to see here, but it's, it begins this decline. So now we know that, you know, Lot is now down in Sodom. You know, we're going to see here in a minute the prayer that Abraham has with God, the petition that God that Abraham has with God. But then we're going to see what happens to Lot after living a while, you know, 16, 17 plus years in Sodom, and watch the moral decline of him and then also of his, of his two daughters. So I, um, I don't want to lose time. I, I, I want to try to get through all this at one time. We can hit back again on, on this more next next week also. But let's, kind of, let's keep going on. <coughs> so... Um, So the men turned it. Now, 23. So Abraham came near and said, now he's talking to God. Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. He starts very low for a large city. Suppose there's 50 righteous. <laughs> he did. I mean, yeah. you know. When you think about it, yeah. When you really think about it, suppose there's just One 50 righteous one. people yeah. in the city. Will you <laughs> indeed sweep away and not spare the place for the sake of the fifty righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, for to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? I mean, you know, this is Abraham talking to God. And we go, oh my God, what did he just do? Guys, I want to be honest with you. God wants frank discussions. God wants us to be open with him. 
He wants to have that relationship. He, he, this doesn't turn off God. You know, he's opening a door. Please, let's have a frank discussion. Tell me what your thoughts are. I, can, I already know what your thoughts are, it says in the scripture. But here, let's, you know, let's hear, let's discuss this out. And so God says, and the Lord said, If I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare the whole place on their account. A very gracious God. A very gracious God. But he knows what's going on. So Abraham replies, Hmm, now behold, I have ventured to speak to the Lord, although I am just dust and ashes. Suppose the 50 righteous are lacking five. Will you destroy the whole city just because of those five? And God said to him, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. And Abraham speaks to the Lord again and says, Suppose 40 are there. And he said, and God says, I will not do it on the account of 40. Then Abraham said, Oh, may the Lord not be angry with me. And, sh and I shall speak, suppose 30 are there. And God said, I will not do it if I find 30. And he said, oh, now behold, I have ventured to speak to the Lord. Suppose there's 20 found there. And God said to him, he said, I will not destroy it on the account of the 20. Then he said, oh, my Lord, do not be angry. For I shall speak only once, this once. Suppose there are 10 there found. And he says, I will not destroy it on the account of ten. Now I want you to stop and think and listen to this prayer. Because what do you see in this prayer? From Abraham's perspective, what do you see? You should be saying a gracious God. He keeps more in his hand and more in his hand. Right? He's humble. He's, what you say? Negotiating. He's negotiating. Why is he negotiating? Lots of yeah, this is the same guy that took 318 men to go rescue Lot. He knows who Lot's there. He doesn't know what Lot's been going through or what Lot's been doing. Hopefully, Lot may have been somewhere where there's at least 10 righteous people. You're going to find out it wasn't even true. Not even for 10. Not even for those that live underneath Lot's household. We'll get to this in a minute. But, you know, there wasn't even 10. You know? But yet, yeah, look at the boldness. Abraham. And now and, and in his boldness, there was also humanity. I'm just dirt and ashes. I know who I am. You know, I know who you are. You are a God who is just. So he's not he not belittling God or anything else. But he's stating his claim. And I and, and, and I love this because a lot of times we don't talk to God honestly, just hey God, you know, and I keep saying this and I, I keep teaching this. Guys, we just need to learn how to talk to God. We just need to learn how to be open. We need to learn how just to cry and say, God, I'm foolish. Or, hey, God, there's this going on in my home. Or, hey, Father, there's this going on at work. I mean, we're not surprising him by anything. But we're just being open with him. And God wants that openness. And sometimes we either we hide from it, thinking, well, God already knows this, so I don't need to talk about it. God wants to have that relationship. And I love what you're seeing here because you're seeing a relationship of a man who's growing in his faith. His faith so strong at this now strong, growing strong enough to where he's even being able to be bold with God and say, hey God, let me negotiate. Let me throw out these petitions because I know who's in that town and I want to protect that person and I hope he's done something different than what that town's been doing to but yet, bottom line is, I'm hoping that lots, one of the ten, and maybe even more, 